It's that time of the month when Mike Esmond from NFB Financial Services joins us for a look at what's driving investors at the moment. Mike, thanks very much for coming in. And let's perhaps start with that Nedbank deal. Of course, we don't have many details yet. We know that HSBC won 70% 70, 70 of Nedbank. We're hoping for a premium. What's your view? What should investors be thinking at this stage? Well, it's interesting that both uh, Nedbank's and Old Mutual share price are nicely up. Uh, it's underpinning the market. Uh, I think that the, the question about bank assurance working or not is always an interesting one. Uh, I, I find that bank assurance has, has not had a, uh, the effect that I think uh, that the boards of the different companies might have wished. I guess that's because we all operate in silos. We all run at 200 miles an hour chasing our own budgets and searching across the, the different silos is not that easy. But I think that Nedbank is a, a major uh, player in the South African retail and commercial and uh, corporate market. It has a place. Uh, it has a footprint that's not going to go away. And I think that HSBC might introduce, or another major global partner like that, might introduce synergies and opportunities to make it an attractive proposition both for shareholders as well as for, uh, for the customers. And of course, because shareholders will be required to sell a portion of their shares if, if it's very similar to the, the Barclays AMSA deal, which it sounds like it is, because of course Barclays bought Sunlum stake plus a stake from all of the minorities as well. So they, they want to see money on the table, how much they're going to get, and I should imagine they want a premium. What sort of premium do you think would be advisable for a deal like this? That's a question like I heard Mike Brown commenting, no comment, is that it's, it's one that you He's can't... He's required to say you, no comment. That's <laughs> right, you can't win that one, is, is, is that I think that the synergy of an international player with its technology, with its experience, with its retail sort of footprint and its corporate and, 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 and institutional experience has to be of value. And uh, I think that that would make sense. So as a strategic investment, uh, Old Mutual being replaced by HSBC as a strategic investment inside of Old Mutual, it could work on the South African uh, on a South African level with HSBC. It might have a pan-African impact. I don't think that HSBC uh, have a massive African footprint, but it can it can roll out, and they probably have the global experience to assist the Nedbank management team do that. So, for investors remaining invested in Nedbank, they should be looking beyond the price. You're saying? Yes, I do believe so. You mentioned bank assurance, and of course. Uh, First strand, which was the, the first model for bank assurance, is unwinding that bank assurance model to a, to a degree. We had Sunlum divesting from ABSA. Uh, Standard Bank's really the only bank assurance model that still seems to work. Yes, and I think if you had to get in, inside the board rooms of uh, Standard Bank, uh, Liberty, and the asset management business between those, uh, there still are, are imperfections, radical imperfections. Uh, it, it's very difficult to to get, I think you've got all sorts of things happening there as well. You've got this conflict of interest regulatory framework that's being added to the advisory uh, laws. Uh, there are all sorts of challenges there. Um, but they, 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 they can work, uh, Stephen. Uh, the will to do it and the environment in which to do it and understanding, I suppose, ultimately, that the investor is the sovereign person who makes the decision. Uh, the old sort of uh, contractual and obligatory buying of a policy to back up your bond, those days are gone. And that's good for the consumer. It'll be more tough on the bank insurance, bank assurance uh, team. Mike, just looking at the, the, the raft of M&A deals that have suddenly come to the fore, we've got BHP Billiton trying to buy Potash. There was news over the weekend that SAB Miller might, might want to buy Foster's, uh, that's the Australian beer company across the HSBC and Nedbank. But this all comes in a context where we've had the US Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, all warning about the growth outlook going forward. Why do you think companies are confident enough to be making those big deals when we don't know if there's going to be a double dip recession? I think that the share prices uh, of companies, in fact, if you look at the American model, profitability there at corporate level has been extraordinary in the last 12 months. I think that they've got rid of a lot of uh, skeletons in closets. I think that the cash flow, the free cash flow that's been generated isn't going out in, traditional, in, in a traditional sense into the consumer, into mortgaging and into lending to business and individuals. So the corporate activity opportunity presents a possible destination. What it also does is that the share prices of the acquired party are probably at significantly depressed levels from, from uh, an historical sort of on, a, on an historical basis. And perhaps it's easier to buy than to build. So if you had to try and recreate a Ned group uh, in a South African context, because South Africa might be tactically important to HSBC as a means to an African end, is that's pretty, pretty difficult to do. You buy a going concern, uh, a, a great organization with a great background, 
uh, that's probably had some issues to deal with. Uh, it's coming out of that, that phase, so probably from that point of view, uh, and uh, just not in the bank and bank assurance space, but across uh, industrial production, uh, there must be some great bargains out there with depressed share prices. Your thoughts on a double dip recession? Do you think it is a risk that we still face? If so, what should investors be doing? It's a significant risk. I think that what's happened is that a couple of years ago, you had a market uh, where the participants were searching for yield and almost disregarding sovereign and other risks. Uh, that obviously came home to roost. You had massive quantitative easing and support, fiscal and monetary support from the central governments and central banks. They've now shot that bullet and they don't have another one necessarily or the political will up the barrel. So if this thing does get into difficulty, you've had markets run ahead of themselves. Earnings multiples are demanding actually. And, and if we're in the higher sort of quartile of where earnings uh, sit historically, then the market won't uh, deal with bad news very easily. You've got Chinese inflation, you've got confusing data coming out of different parts of the world. The state's numbers and the UK and European numbers are terrible. And you've got sovereign issues in the, U in the, in the Eurozone uh, and I think other places as well, which we'll, we'll, we'll come to find out about. So it's not an area where double dip is anywhere past or in a, in a sort of a, a fallacy and a maybe thing. It's very, very real. And if that does happen, people need to be defensively positioned uh, to take advantage of growth that's maybe happened in markets. Maybe if they need the income that their portfolio will deliver and don't have the appetite for downside, having learned two or three years back uh, how, how difficult that can be, is to take some, some skin out of the game and go into more cautious, perhaps income generating, tax efficient income generating if possible assets.